so I won't go over that right now. Um, but the progress that's been made on public access by the Muskegon Lake Watershed Partnership and its public access committee are that, well, the public access committee formed uh, this uh, in 2019 in May. Um, they gathered baseline information to assess the status of and the potential for public outdoor recreation on the Muskegon Lake shoreline. And there are some maps in the back that we'll put out and you can grab before you leave tonight that um, kind of assess each of the publicly owned parcels that have some type of public access feature. And one side will have a map, the other side has some of the um, committee's recommendations on how they could be improved. So we want to take your input on that. So if you take one of those maps, um, there's one for each of the parcels along the, the lake shore, um, we'd like to hear from you on what you think that we should be doing to improve these public access sites. So you can write on them, you can scan it and fax it uh, or email it to us, uh, drop it off at the office, whatever, but um, we wanna hear more from you about that. And that doesn't take the place of public hearings and city meetings and things like that. They still need to hear from you on important projects, but this is for the Muskegon Lake Watershed Partnership uh, for their information to see what they can do to be a partner in making sure we have public access for outdoor recreation. Um, so the handouts are back at the display table. There's a front and back just to, as an example of one of them um, that shows Hart Shore and Marina, the boundary on one side, and on the back side some pictures and some of those rec recommendations. Um, and then there's a fact sheet that the group also developed that talks about the benefits of shoreline access and public outdoor recreation kind of in their own words. And you're all invited to be part of that public access committee. They'll continue to meet. Um, and there's a sign-in sheet in the back where you can sign up and let us know if you want to be involved in, in that. Um, so, I don't wanna um, talk too much about the benefits because uh, of public access, because uh, Dr. Alan Steinman is gonna be talking more specifically about that, but I'd like to draw your attention to an article in the Strong Towns Journal, Lake Effect. And it really um, explains how lakes that have public access around them versus those that have all private, especially residential or other non-water dependent uses, um, really uh, don't yield the same benefits to the community. In fact, the ones that have the public access, in this case, two case a case study of two lakes in Minneapolis, or Minnesota, show that, and you can go to the next slide, um, show that the whole community benefits when we have public access and it actually yields more taxable value to the community to be able to take care of these resources. So the top graph shows distance from the lake. If you live real close to the lake, um, the value per acre is very high, but as you get farther away in meters from the lake, the value is very, very low. And where the community that actually had public access around the lake, everyone's taxable values went up, so it was better for the community overall. And then Al will probably talk about this too. We had a study done through Grand Valley State University of one of our projects and it um, gave us a great return on the investment. Um, well, that might have been a different slide. Uh, so um, Muskegon Lake Watershed Partnership feels that we can foster community development through sustainable use of natural resources. We can ensure that local residents, including young people, have connections and opportunities related to nearby, nearby outdoor assets uh, to foster community pride, good stewardship, and local economic benefits. Um, we can market our downtown as a gateway to nearby public waters uh, to capture and amplify outdoor recreation dollars. And by developing a community consensus on the management of outdoor assets to reduce potential conflicts and ensure sustainable use of resources. Um, we can go on because Al has something on that. Um, here's just a few uh, slides that I'll show you of just a, a selection of some of our um, outdoor public access locations for those who may not be as familiar with what they look like. This is Heritage Landing. You can see some shoreline use there. Um, there's an ex, uh, some uh, kayak launching, uh, shore fishing. Uh, we have cruise ships that come in. Um, the former Teldon Continental Motors, um, there was a brownfield development. We have Edison Landing, Boardwalk along here. We have some concerns with being able to get to it. We have to find ways to get to that nice boardwalk to, to provide access. 
Uh, Grand Trunk down in Lakeside has some um, access within walking distance of the neighborhood, so it's a great example of having a place for kids to be able to go down and just play and catch frogs and turtles and you know wade in the water and get their toes wet. Um, the Harbor Town Beach is nice down at the west end of the lake. Um, and then a Fisherman's Landing at the east of the lake we think of as being a place for bass tournaments and campground and launch ramps. It also has a nice shallow water area and a nice lawn area um, as well. And then um, Hartshorn has some nice access for ice fishing and shore fishing and some nice views. And Veterans Memorial Park, not on the, not on the lake. Um, Richards Park's not on the lake, but we do have access there. JC's Launch Ramp at Cottage Grove has a popular place to launch boats. And then we're actually doing a restoration project through the office where I work with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative to restore part of the former Amoco tank farm and remove some of that concrete wall that blocks the land from the water. And we feel that what we're doing there is very much in keeping with the Imagine Muskegon Lake plan. So we're working with the city on that. And not to say that we expect everybody else to take care of these things. We do have volunteers who go out and actually take care of a lot of the shoreline assets that have been restored. Um, through the Shoreline Stewards Program. And so that's just some examples of some trainings we had this year. So people are learning how to manage these native plants and get rid of the invasive plants. And we want to expand that program and work closely with the city and other landowners on that. Uh, Grand Trunk, there's friends of Grand Trunk, friends of the Lakeshore Trail, uh, friends of Ryerson Creek, uh, friends of Heritage Landing. So if you want to get on Facebook and get involved with those, I'm sure that the Shoreline Steward leaders of the Muskegon Lake Watershed Partnership would love that. We learn about the non-native invasives like spotted knapweed and how we need to pull those. Um, and there's an annual shoreline cleanup every year in, in April that, um, that we would love everybody to be involved in. Um, having access to the shoreline provides opportunities for education, hands-on learning. That's a whole separate chapter of the action plan. Uh, the next slide, um, again, we are becoming lake people. Um, it's taking some, some time, but we're, we're getting there. And we want to make sure everybody knows that you're all invited to participate in the monthly meetings, sign up for um, any of these activities, and I hope I didn't go too far over time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> there are note cards that um, you can use if you think of a question, because we're going to have questions at the end, and I know that's difficult sometimes. So, um, Gail, if you want to go around and maybe just pass a few note cards around to the tables, that might be helpful so people don't have to get up. Um, you know, you don't need to take a note card, but um, if you'd like to do that, we can collect them too, and we can consolidate. Uh, questions because we don't have a lot of time. A little bit over. Yes. Um, I'm not going to use the microphone. I can speak loud. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about uh, today is the status of Muskegon Lake, and we're going to talk about that project that uh, Kathy alluded to. Shoreline restoration, what it meant in terms of the return to this uh, community, and then give you a little overview of how the Stephen Lake is doing in terms of its water quality. Uh, this restoration project was funded through the stimulus money in era back in 2010, uh, passed through from NOAA and GLRI, or after the stimulus dollars. The restoration goal was to soften the shoreline, as Kathy mentioned, a lot of the part of the shoreline from past activities. Had a drop, uh, cutoffs instead of having a nice shallow slope. This is what we want is we have a nice shallow slope, and the vegetation comes back, and the vegetation comes back, then the bugs come back, and the bugs come back, the fish come back, and when the fish come back, the people come back, and that's what we want. It also restored some wetlands and removed a lot of the, the crap that we had in the lake, about 135,000 cubic yards. It included restoration design, the construction, and the monitoring which is what AWRI did in terms of this project. And we had three monitoring elements. One was to look at the macrophyte, which my lab did. The fish was done by Carl Weeks, who's a fishery biologist here at the Institute. And then the socioeconomics was done by Dr. Paul Isley at the Seaford College of Business, along with Elaine Isley, who's working here at the time. I see Elaine. Um, and uh, some other people that we had working in my lab at that time. So I'm going to talk about the socioeconomic part. 
And Paul's study actually had three components, uh, but only two of them did we include in the final economic analysis. So I'm going to talk about the travel cost survey, and then also the hedonics, which is basically the change in real estate value as a function of the restoration project. <coughs> and if you want more information, by the way, this is published in the Journal of Great Lakes Research, so if you have any problems sleeping, this would be a great thing. <laughs> <laughs> you think I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the travel cost survey, there were two parts to that. The first part was the main survey, and this was going to generate data from people being surveyed on why they were coming to the lake, uh, how long they, they were staying and how far they had traveled, the frequency of the visits to different sites on the lake, how much they were spending, and some basic demographics about the person being surveyed. We conducted the survey at six different sites along the south and east shoreline, basically the areas that were being restored. And then as part of the survey work to be statistically rigorous, every third adult was interviewed, and both on weekdays and weekends, and as a lane will attest, both in good weather and in bad weather. So here are the six sites, uh, ranging as far west as Cottage Grove, and Kathy just showed you a slide of that, and as far north and east as the Muskegon Lake Nature Preserve, which is just on the west or north side of the north branch of the Muskegon River. Um, the second part was an augmented augmentation on the first part of the travel cost survey, where we asked the respondents if they would visit Muskegon Lake more often as a result of the restoration, and this was done at various locations, not necessarily on the lake, but at the mall, at the movie theater, places like that, where we felt that there would be visitors. And so what we found out as part of this survey result is that the value of a trip to Muskegon Lake was estimated to be a little less than $40 per visit. About half of the respondents planned to visit the lake at least once more per year due to the restoration activities that we were doing on the lake. And so the total additional visits, when you extrapolated it out across all of the county, would add another 65,000 visitors from within the Stephen County, the Stephen County residents, and about 18,000 would come from Kent County. Those would be additional visitors at the function of restoring the Stephen Lake Shore. As far as the hedonics are concerned, this was we looked at residential housing in the prior 20 years. This study was done in 2012 and 2013. So the prior 20 years were, were 1991 to 2011. And we excluded houses that the sales prices were less than $40,000 per year. Uh, if they were older than 150 years old, if they were very small, less than 500 square feet, or very large, more than 4,000 square, square feet, and if they had a view of Lake Michigan, they were also excluded. And we examined values of houses between 100 and 800 meters of shoreline. As Kathy showed in her previous slide, may not have caught this, but if you remember the Minneapolis lakes that were being restored between 100 and 900 meters once the restoration occurred, it was pretty even in terms of the increase in real estate value uh, if the restoration had taken place. So there's a, a, this kind of an